welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. Seven ways to think like a 21st century economist. Buckminster Fuller, be old Bucky, he once said that you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you need to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Now, this book takes up this challenge of the whole system, probably one of the biggest challenges anyone could probably take up, and it sets out a whole bunch of mind-shifting ways in which we can all learn to think like a 21st century economist. So, it really reveals the old ideas and sort of like pulls their pants down, a bit of the emperor's new clothes sort of thing going on, and it proposes a whole new economic story that is told in pictures just as much as in words. The idea is to get rid of the old ideas that kind of trapped us and replace them with new ones that kind of inspire us. Now, if you look at it, there's been extraordinary strides in human well-being over the past 60 years. And if you think back to our Enlightenment Now episode from last year, there was a whole bunch of ways in which the world is so much better today. If you think about it, the average child born on planet Earth in 1950 had a expected life expectancy of 48 years. Fast forward to today, it's 71 years. And then since 1990 alone, the number of people living in extreme poverty, so on less than two bucks a day, has fallen by half. Yeah, it's insane. I think whenever we read a book or you do a book that's about like changing the world, you also got to have that enlightenment now, Mm. part in context. And this is what definitely Kate has done. So it's sort of like keeping some of the good stuff we've had in the past, but also trying to inspire some uh, new ways of thinking and new models and systems. Yeah, that's right. That's that's a good news, but kind of the rest of the story isn't so good. There's still... Uh, one in nine people don't have enough food to eat. In 2015, there were 6 million children under the age of five who died and more than half of those were actually due to easily treatable conditions, things like diarrhea and malaria that uh, that really didn't need to happen. And there's still 2 billion people that are living on less than $3 a day and 70 million young people who can't find work. Yeah, and at the same time, you got like so many people dying, people who can't find work, um, people just struggling in their day-to-day lives. And then you got like the rich, world's richest 1%. Obviously, who own more than the other ninety nine percent? Like you, you, we've all heard that stat before, but it's pretty crazy, isn't it? One percent own more than all other ninety nine percent combined. So you could say there's something a bit sick with this system, and something isn't going right, and there is a better way of doing it. Global economic output is expected to grow by around three percent a year from now until twenty fifty. And so what that means is that we're going to double the global economy by 2037 and almost triple by 2050, which is a that's a bloody big growth. It a is. A lot of growth. Well, it's insane, isn't it? And a lot of that growth is going to be found in some of the what's the developing countries now who are going to all move into the middle class. So the middle class is going to go from $2 billion today to about $5 billion in 2030. And they're all the people like you and me, right? We like a steak for dinner. We like to go out for a beer and a palma. We like to... Uh, have a car and drive somewhere. And this brings a huge surge in demand for materials and consumer products for all these people who um, who want to live a better life for themselves and their family. But that means like it's going to put insane pressures on the, on the earth and our systems uh, in the 21st century. So we need to really have a think about what we're, how we're going to achieve this journey ahead. That's right. One way to think about it is just growth, 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 growth. But we need to kind of think about what kind of worldview or paradigm or frame is going to be best serving the purpose or the context that we're about to face coming up. Because as humanity's context, as our values uh, evolve, as we continually try to improve uh, the way of life for everybody around the world, so too should the way that we envision and measure the economy as well. Global leaders regularly meet up to discuss uh, the global economy. And in 2014, they met in Brisbane, Australia to discuss global trade. And all the G20 leaders, so the leaders of the the developed countries, um, pledged to grow their economies by 2.1%. And they added that this was a little bit more ambitious and a little bit better than 2%. 2.1 sounded a bit (laughs) right. and um, So, they were happy with that sort of target. The thing with this was that just literally a couple of days before this big meeting, there was also another big meeting and that was the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the findings from that IPCC in 2014 were that the world faced severe, pervasive and irreversible damage from rising greenhouse gas emissions. But when it came to the big G20 meeting, uh, which was hosted by the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, Tony Abbott, it wasn't really about climate change. It was all about growth, 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 growth. Let's grow the economy and let's grow our GDP. 
And that's why they set that goal of 2.1% GDP growth across all those G20 countries. Yeah, and he was pretty pissed off that the meeting's agenda had been cluttered and taken over by climate change and um, it sort of distracted them from their top priority, which was economic GDP growth, as if those two things are completely uh, detached and mm. they're, they're not related whatsoever. Now, GDP, what it does is it measures the market value of goods and services produced within a nation's borders in a year, so GDP, gross domestic product, and has long been used as the leading indicator of economic health. But like in the in the context of today's social and ecological crises, how is this like single one narrow metric um, commanded pretty much all the international attention? Right, you only got one measure of, yeah. of everything, and that's it. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's not when when there's so many different factors in play, you can't measure it just with, with this one measure of saying, yeah, our GDP has gone up, so everybody's better off. It just doesn't really work. Mm. And there's probably been like some. Um, correlation, not causation. Like mm. the, the the planet has improved in different areas in terms of human well-being, alongside GDP. But perhaps GDP isn't the entire causation, right? Like if we actually look at it, there might be some other metrics and ways we can measure things to see how well humans are flourishing. What uh, what Kate, the author, says? She says that GDP is a cuckoo in the economic nest, and I guess to understand that you kind of you got to kind of understand a little thing about cuckoos um and they're pretty they're interesting birds so what a cuckoo does rather than you know work really hard to go get some sticks and branches and make their own nest and then work really hard to have a kid and then you know once it pops out of the egg you got to go and get worms and bugs and stuff to come and feed it you got to you know digest it then spew it up into the baby's mouth it sounds like a lot of work so what the cuckoo does instead was they just they just kind of look around and find what other nests are already out there what other birds have already laid their eggs they've already kind of laid the foundations and the cuckoo just pops over and drops a little nice little egg into that nest and when the cuckoo chick hatches before the other ones it just kicks out the other eggs and then when the when the parents come back, they're like, "Oh, this is our eggs hatched. This is our baby." Turns out it's not actually their baby; it's just a little cuckoo instead. So these parents are working really hard to grow this cuckoo baby. It's bloody genius from a <laughs> uh, from a uh, genes point of view, a selfish genes point of view. Especially like, say, if you're, you know, you can have a limited amount of children in one life if you're a, if you're a, if you're a bird, right? But you can have unlimited. <laughs> based on stealing other people's resources right. to propagate your own genes into the world. I say brilliant from a selfish gene point of view from a, you know Richard Dawkins book, but it's a great strategy from it's a, that point of view. It really is. a really low effort for you. All you've got to do is pop out the egg and everything else you is taken out care of. You in your lifetime. <laughs> That's right. And so this is kind of what happened in economic metrics as well in that if a bird leaves their nest unattended, they might find that it gets hijacked by the cuckoos. And in economics, if you kind of lose sight of your goals, if you're not really strictly paying attention to all the different various metrics, all of a sudden you realize that your economic nest might be hijacked and the the old GDP cuckoo has taken over everything. Yeah, that's it. It's like at one stage, the question might have been, hey, what enables human beings to thrive? And it could have been a whole bunch of different things, like living with dignity, opportunity, community, um, growth, all those sorts of things. Lots of measures of this one, yeah. There's lots of one. measures and then one day, all of a sudden, um, you went out for a stroll and you came <laughs> back and some economist just planted in this one metric, which was uh, GDP. Yeah, it's a lot simpler, yeah. It's like if, you, if you're if you a bird and you've got six different eggs and six different babies you've got to feed and then they all get kicked out by this one cuckoo, actually... You might think, oh, well, this is a bit easier. I can sort of take the foot off the pedal a bit. Same with the economists. Rather than doing all these measures and thinking, you know, it's a very hard, very complex question with a whole bunch of different facets, let's just use GDP and let's just measure that and just that kind of will solve all our problems. So Kate's getting back in the nest here. She wants to boot out <laughs> the old cuckoo of GDP and really get to the question of what's actually going to make us thrive. And this is where her whole idea of donut economics comes in. And it, what it does, it ensures prosperity for all that are living in within the planet. And in other words, we need to get within the donut, which is sort of like a sweet spot for humanity. So what exactly is the donut? Uh, aside, besides being a, a tasty but very unhealthy snack, it is. Uh, we can look at this, this shape to sort of look at the perfect little sweet spot in which we're safeguarding the world in which we're living in, but we're also satisfying every person's needs as well. So in a sense, you got like two lines of the donut or two circumferences uh, and we're in the sweet spot. So let's say if we're going from the very center outwards, the first line we hit is the very bare minimum that humans need 
for well-being. And if you go below this, mm. um, humans are going below the shortfalls of human well-being and uh, they're not really getting life's essentials such as your food, your education and your housing. So if you blow that, it's a very bad thing. After that line, you've sort of got the sweet spot where you should be leaving. Then the next line is our ecological ceiling. So uh, based on human beings on the planet, if you, you're taking in too much, you're consuming way too much, you're really overshooting the outside of, of that as well. So you're going above the ceiling and you're putting an overshoot of pressure on Earth's life-giving systems such as your, your climate change, your ocean acidification, your chemical pollution. So really, we want to be in this sweet spot, shaped like our little donut, uh, like our favorite donuts at... What's our favorite donut? <laughs> what is that place called? I had the donut, like, uh, Krispy Kreme's donuts. I had oh, one yeah. last week. It was very really delicious. It was my uh, cheat day, which slowly been coming cheap three days, four days. <laughs> That's all right. Mate, those donuts you brought over to the, the barbecue were pretty tasty donuts Great as well. Great donuts, mate. And this, these are the sort of... Do- oh, well, they were the donuts with no hole in the middle. We want the, the donuts with a hole in the middle, and that's where that's what our sweet spot is. That's right. So the we know that that uh, if you go too low, you're going to miss out on satisfying human needs. If you go too high, we're going to be really putting strain on on Earth systems. If you think about on the low end, there's a whole bunch of basics that everybody really needs to be satisfied, to be fulfilled in order for them to have a good and decent life. Things, the obvious ones, you know, sufficient food, clean water, decent salination, access to energy, clean cooking facilities. Then you've also got your things like access to education and healthcare, a minimum income, decent work, decent housing, access to networks of information and also networks of social support. And furthermore, there's also other important uh, things that we need, things like gender equality, social equality, a political voice, bit of peace, bit of justice. All of these things are the basics that we really need to satisfy for every single person on earth. Setting a target date to achieve all of them for every person seems like a wild ambition. It's now an official one. It's uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, agreed by 193 countries in 2015, kind of signed up to these these pledges, and the vast majority of goals need to be achieved by 2030. So we are, We're almost halfway there. We are. Are we on track? We're, we are on track to a whole bunch of them, I think. I remember I heard a lot about the sustainable development goals when it was being made and every now and then some people make reference to it but i haven't i don't you don't see too many updates on the news about how we're tracking for these big important goals it doesn't come on the news there's a lot of companies pledging them still <laughs> yeah, that's right in the private sector but maybe not so much in the public sector but at the end of the day um the picture is clearer than ever before despite if you heard on enlightenment now we have had unprecedented progress in human well-being over the last 70 years it's insane the standard of living we've hit but right now, we are far beyond our boundary on all sides, all right? Like some people are, if you look at a donut, some people are probably like hectares away from, kilometers away from the outer edge of the donut and some people are right in that middle. Mm. So it's sort of just having that harmony and everything in balance and we're living within the, the, the chalky donut. <laughs> That's right. As we, we listed off all those really, really basic things that I think everybody can agree that are absolute necessities, uh, but even still, even with all that growth, the numbers still don't lie that one in nine don't have enough access to food to eat. One in three don't have access to a toilet. Is that right or is that a typo? Is that That's right. Wow. And one in 11 have no source of safe drinking water. There's still plenty of work to go. As the subtitle suggests, the subtitle, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. Well, it's probably time to list out what are these seven ways to think. The first way to think like a 21st century economist is to change the goal. As we've said, for the last 70-odd years, economics, it's been fixated on GDP, on this gross domestic product, on our national output. It became our primary measure of success and progress, and it's really become a fixation. But for the 21st century economist, a far bigger goal and far more all-encompassing goal is needed. It's It needs to be goals that really meet the human rights of every person within the means of our life-giving planet. And that goal really, as we've talked about, has to be within that big old donut. The second way to think is we need to see the big picture. If you did university, like our show did economics and uh, you didn't score too well on it, so I'm, <laughs> I don't I'll remember this not one remembering this one, but <laughs> um, it depicts the whole economy, which is like one limited image, which is the circular flow diagram. Just shows the flow of goods and services between the parties themselves, and uh, it doesn't really account for, say, a bigger picture and sort, you know, the externalities and whatnot. And it really, the limitations have been used to reinforce the neoliberal narrative about the efficiency of the markets, 
or the incompetence of the states, the domesticity of the household and the tragedy of the commons. So it's time to get out there and draw a new picture on this one. The third way is to n- nurture human nature, uh, which is harder to say than, uh, than you think. But at the heart of 20th century economics, it was the, the rational economic man. It was that we are all self-interested, isolated, tal- calculating, fixed in our tastes, dominant over nature. And this has kind of shaped the people we've become. But as we know, human nature is far richer than that. Uh, we're social, we're dependent and independent, we're sort of approximating more so than calculating, we're fluid in our values, we kind of change our mind a lot. So really, we've got to take into account our real human nature and not just say that we're just this very simple, calculating, rational person. Fourth, we need to get savvy with systems. There's the iconic crisscross of the market supply. I remember that one. I remember that one, supply and demand. (laughs) That's an easy one. A plus for you there, mate. (laughs) That was day one though. (laughs) (laughs) I think you knew that before. I think that was like year seven maybe. (laughs) That's all right. But it's the first one that most economic students encounter, but it's really um, rooted in misplaced 18th century metaphors on just mechanical equilibrium. It's essentially like you just, you know, there's two things interacting yeah. with each other, A <laughs> equals B, yeah. but we always forget that C, D, yeah. E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P um, <laughs> is still part of it. And that's when we're getting uh, savvy with systems. There's unintended consequences. And there's also unknown unknowns that mm. are part of these systems. And if we don't accept that there are some things that we don't fully get with systems, then sometimes like you simplify it down, you burn it down to something as simple as that curve. And you mm. whole, miss a whole bunch of stuff in that process. Most certainly. The fifth way is we need to design to distribute. So inequality seems to be a feature uh, of common e- of today's economics, but she says it's not really a necessity. So maybe it's not a feature. Maybe it's more of a of, of a bug. Uh, more maybe it's more of a design failure. So twenty first century economists they recognise that there are actually different ways to design economies to be far more distributive of the value that they generate, rather than just Musk taking all the all the profits at the top. Maybe it should be spread around a bit more. Must save in the world, baby. Uh, Musk wouldn't get an A plus in this book, I reckon. That's all right. Sixth, create to regenerate. So economic theory like has the clean environment as a luxury good, affordable only for the well-off, but there is no such rule law. Um, ecological degradation is simply the result of degenerative industrial design. So I guess in our metaphor, we see like the environment is like a little cow. You sort of just milk it, squeeze it all out for all its juice and its goodness. And that's about it. But instead, if we're thinking like we should in the 21st century, sort of create and regenerate. So in a sense, maybe not the same metaphor. You get that milk like and you're just squeezing just... it back into the milk. <laughs> <laughs> squeezing it back into the cow. Well, because the cow probably does, you know, eats grass and then makes some new milk. So I reckon that was a that was a, probably the uh, wrong... Well done, actually. Sure. <laughs> Close the on that one. Uh, and then the seventh way to think like a 21st century economist is to be agnostic about growth. There's one diagram in economic theory that is really dangerous if you think about it. It never really actually gets drawn and that's the long-term path of economic growth. If we just grow by 2.1% a year or 3% a year forever, it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and it just keeps going. But what's what's the end point? It just keeps going up. Yeah, it just keeps going. No one really like <laughs> projects it too far ahead today. Yeah, that's right. We've gone to 2050 at this in you know in these studies, but I don't know what happens after that. It yeah, just I don't keeps think going anyone's up. ambitious enough to go 2050 because <laughs> um, exponential curves get pretty insane oh, when yeah. you draw them out too far. So the seven ways of thinking like a 21st century economist doesn't really lay out specific policy descriptions at the granular level or institutional fixes. There's no real immediate answers of what to do next. But we need to fundamentally, radically change the way we think about ec- economics and, and the way this century demands. And one way we can do it is sort of flipped the natural script that we have on our story about what it is being a human being sort of parading around on this planet Earth. I kind of like this metaphor that she's used here. It's like a, it's like a musical or a play where you've got different actors or different uh, cast members in this story. And we'll run through the the cast of the 20th century uh, as I do like, you know, in the... When you're watching the credits at the end of the movie, they list them in order of appearance. So we'll list them out that way as Most well. Most important one pops yeah. up first. You're not going to get the pleb. <laughs> That's right. That pops up, are you? That's right. The person with the 30 second cameo. We go on the main characters here, and then and then going in order from there. So the 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 first uh, cast member onto the stage. That's the market. The market is efficient, so we're going to give it free reign. As Adam Smith famously wrote, the butcher and the brew and the baker. They're not benevolently making uh, their meat and their bread and their, their beer just for everybody to have a nice tasty dinner. They're actually doing it because they have regard for their own self-interest. They're going to make something out of this as well. 
So the market's the big dog there. Second in order is uh, the business. And business is innovative. So we need to let the innovators go out there and do what they do best and make the change, uh, better changes in the world. So the business of business is business. (laughs) And what firms bring together, they get labor and they're very efficient at putting capital together to produce novel goods and services and maximizing their profits. There's really no need to look at what goes on behind the scenes in the factories and farms as long as they're sort of playing within the legal rules of the game. Yeah, that's right. We've got finance. Finance, it's, it's infallible, so we're going to trust in its ways. The banks, they take people's savings and they very cleverly uh, turn this into profitable investments. So it means the, the businesses that need investment, they get their funds that they need. The people who have given over their savings, they get a little bit in return as well. So it seems like a real good win-win-win system. Trade, it's win-win. So, open your borders. Um, both parties, you're going to gain from it. It's win-win, as your old mate Covey says, uh, no matter how unequal they are. So, hence trade barriers, they should be dismantled. You've got the state. But the state, it's a little bit incompetent, so we're not going to let it meddle. Don't it's let seem, it touch anything. It seems like every time the government tries to intervene in the market, they kind of make things worse. They kind of stuff it up more than they distort incentives. They, uh, they pick the white elephants instead of the winners. Uh, which sounds like a very bad thing to do by the sounds of it. Maybe you want a grey elephant instead. Uh, whenever the government tries to smooth out the business cycle, they kind of stuff up the timing and they actually make it worse than if they had to just let it run. So let's just let's keep their grubby hands out of everything and let's just run it for ourselves. I think that's a, quite an accurate and uh, and unbiased sort of picture of I'd say what our economic story is to to be on this earth. And these are the things that he always gets spoken about in terms of the goals and in improving human well-being and, and whatnot. Me and you, Asha, have probably been spruiking the same story in different sort of ways over time. But when we're talking about this story, these characters are kind of just don't pop up on mm. stage whatsoever. A few people went to the casting, uh, went to the auditions, but they didn't get selected for a role at all. So they're just, uh, they're just hanging out behind the shadows or maybe they're watching on, but they're not really part of this big story. None whatsoever. And one is the household. What happens here is the household, they sort of supply the labor and capital to the market. There's no need to sort of lift the roof and just see what goes on between the four walls. Um, The ones who are taking care of the domestic affairs, they sort of belong to the home. And this isn't really something that contributes to the GDP, right? Like the thing that actually makes the economy and human well-being thrive. Remember, GDP is the only metric at the moment. Anything that goes on in the household, it just doesn't really matter or contribute yeah, to anything, does it? That's right. Let's just forget about it. We won't even count it. Another one that missed out is the commons, uh, which are tragic. So we sell them off things. Uh, the tragedy of the commons is like where there's shared resources, things like grazing fields and fish stocks, they, they tend to be overexploited by a few individuals. You know, you've got the uh, sea spiracy where you've got these, a couple of people that are going out and, and getting all the fish in the sea because it's, it's kind of a common thing available to everybody. But what that means is that because there's a couple of people that are overexploiting it, it means it gets depleted for everybody. So everybody loses out. And see, it's the old game theory when everyone's pursuing their own self-interest and doing what's best for them. You get a whole bunch of them doing the same thing. Everyone is worse off for it, even mm. though you're doing what's best for yourself. So <laughs> that's a, right. That's a tragedy. That's right. Society, it's non-existent, so ignore it. Uh, the old Margaret Thatcher, she famously declared in the 1980s, there's only individual men and women and their families and it's the market that connects them. There's no mm. real such thing as societies because if you drill yeah. down, it's just individual people. We don't need to cast society in our play. Another one we don't need to worry about in the play is Earth. Earth, it's inexhaustible, so let's just take all we want. You know, there's not really going to be a shortage of Earth supplies. You know, if it's uh, things like, say, copper or oil, if they start to run low, we'll just raise the price. Maybe people use it a little bit more sparingly, uh, but we're just going to find other sources. There's always going to be something that we can find to, to milk from the cow's milk that you were talking about before of planet Earth, and we can just take something else. It's been an undeniably brilliant lineup. Mm, it's a few play. missing characters, but a great play. Uh, it's promised a neoliberal script and a road to freedom. Who could be against that? But putting this blind faith in the markets whilst ignoring some of the other characters and having it in this order of the appearance might not cut it as we move into the new century. What the new century requires is a, a new show um, cast in a different order of appearance. That's right. This show that we've been watching so far has kind of taken us to the brink of ecological, social, and financial collapse because of the cast members cast in the wrong order. So instead, Kate suggests, let's go for a different show and we'll flip the script around a little bit and we'll cast it in a different order. So the first, uh, the first actor walking onto stage in Kate's play is actually Earth. Earth is... It's life-giving, so we kind of got to, we've got to respect the boundaries. 
So it's not just a, a an inexhaustible source of just the the basic stuff we need. It actually our economy exists within a biosphere. It's a delicate uh, zone in which we're living. Uh, the land, the waters, the atmosphere. We're continually drawing upon it, and it matters that we keep it healthy so that we can continue to draw upon it as well. Second is society, and this is foundational, so we need to nurture the connections of the human beings within society. Um, Political theorists use the term social capital to sort of describe the wealth of trust and reciprocity that is created within social groups as a result of the networks and relationships. So let's say you're just like going for a coffee and someone, there's just good shit happening everywhere. And <laughs> sort of like there's good shit happening everywhere. You've got this feeling of recipro- <laughs> reciprocity. Reciprocity. <laughs> It's a very simple version of what she was saying. If you go to the cafe and there's good shit happening, then that's good. <laughs> I think she had something a little bit deeper than that, but yeah. A bit deeper. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's very surprising. You're going to start doing some good shit for other people if that's, that's the case. Right. If everyone's out for themselves, uh, just as individuals, it's going to be a bit, right. a bit of a different story. Yeah. Mate, it's an issue. You said before, you know, Thatcher said in the 1980s, there's no society, it's just individuals and they, they, they work together when they have to. But in this, new, in this new script, there is that societal element, which is, as you say, vitally important. Good shit happened in the cafes. Kind of a bit of a um, <laughs> good shit in the cafe. <laughs> uh, the next one is the economy, which is diverse. So we need to support all of its systems. So as we've been harping on, it's not just about GDP. It's about all the different systems within that economy. Now, the household, this is core, so we need to value its contribution. Now, I bloody love this sentence here. It's one of my highlights of the book. When Adam Smith was talking about the baker and the butcher, he also forgot about the benevolence of the mother, and that was Margaret Douglas. Cause, His mother, yeah. <laughs> uh, Adam Smith, he sort of was uh, raised from her since birth, and Smith, he never married, and he never had a wife to rely upon. But when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he moved back in with his mum, and uh, then he could expect his dinner every day. Mm. So... It wasn't just the people out there, um, the, the butcher and the bakers. It was also the ability for him to go home and his mother to take care of him within the four walls and actually cook him dinner every night, especially so he could go out there and write the wealth of nations to change the world. So that little story about having to go back home and having that benefit um, from the maternal carer, whoever that might be, uh, always gets left out, but it probably shouldn't. Yeah, that's right. As, as we said previously, the the household, the, the wives and mothers and daughters who were taking care of the domestic affairs, they weren't calculated at all in the previous one. But now we're saying that actually uh, it can't be ignored. This is exactly what you need to fuel all the other elements of capital. Yeah, of course. Uh, at the time of uh, uh, Adam Smith, it was all it was the you know always the female in that sense, but today it would probably be the maternal carer, whoever they might be. And in this new story, it's getting in, injected and being valued in its contribution. The next character that we need to include in this is the market. But the market is very powerful, so we need to be wise about how we embed it. Previously, the market, that was the number one, the main character of the, of the play. Now, it's going to drop down to sixth or seventh most important, but still vitally important. So it needs to be in there as well, but just treated uh, with a little bit more wisdom than what we have in the past. Yeah, it's a bit like fire, extremely efficient at what it does, but dangerous if it sort of gets out of control. So when it's unconstrained, it sort of like puts the stresses on the earth, sources and sinks, and it fails to deliver the essential public goods from education, vaccines, roadways, and, and railways. Next is the commons, which are creative, so unleash their mm. potential. So... Think of how a village might manage its only fresh water in its nearby forest. So if they actually um, become creative together, they can solve that issue. And uh, there are some times when when people collaborate together to make something as a net positive when they come together. Think of Wikipedia. Mm. People just investing their own time uh, unselfishly to contribute to Wikipedia and we've all got a better resource because of it. Next, the state is essential, so we need to make it accountable. Previously, we said they were incompetent, so let's keep them out of the picture. Now we're saying, well, it is essential for them to sort of monitor and manage things, but we've got to hold them accountable to make sure they're doing it in the right way as well. So state is second last in this appearance. They still get a role. Mm. Last in is business, mm. and this is innovative, so we need to give it purpose. So we know that businesses can be extraordinarily effective in combining people, technology, energy, materials, capital, and resource, finance, to sort of create something new. So this is going to be something extremely important for human flourishing and uh, it's so innovative. So we need to give it a purpose to actually improve the common good of everybody.
our beliefs about economic growth, they're almost religious. They're personal in nature, very political in consequence. They're privately held, very little discussed and brought into the open. So, as we're uh, as our discussions get going, we need to consider what it would take for people to switch sides. How do we uh, proselytize to convert somebody to a different religion? Jeez, that's one hell of a word there. What's that mean? <laughs> I... Uh, it came off uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, a Jewish guy who became... Uh, this is probably way off track from this episode, actually. Jeez, but I've never heard this word. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's like you know, spreading the message to Proce- bring people I, to I your side. I won't even try and repeat that word. <laughs> but no country has ever ended human deprivation without growing an economy. And no country has ever ended ecological degradation with one. Mm. So, 21st century economists now face a challenge that their predecessors do not even have to contemplate. All you had to do was just grow the economy, human mm. well-being went up. No doubt there are some stresses now, uh, despite things thriving so much in the past. That bloody GDP thing we were talking about, uh, it looks beautiful, man. That graph mm. going up, it looks causal to human well-being, which in some ways it, it is and it's also correlated. But all you got to do is extrapolate that. Mm. The economic thing is just growing the middle class. It's going to put more and more pressures on the earth systems, that's undoubtedly true. And at some stage, those stress is going to hit a breaking point if things don't change. Yeah, that's right. We're headed for all those things we listed before. If you're going too high or too low, uh, we've got to kind of ask, are we there yet? You know, we're in this economic aeroplane. Can we keep on cruising at the current trajectories or are we about to stall midair and come plummeting back down to earth? You don't want that, do you? <laughs> Not at all. And one thing's for certain out of all this, it's heading for a destination that we don't mm. want to reach, one that is degenerative and deeply divisive. I think just taking a metaphor of it, it's like still pointing upwards. One stage, you're going to hit in space. Yeah. You? <laughs> and you're going to have no oxygen to actually get the lift and drag and you'll conk out <laughs> and people will pass out and nod. But you don't want to be too close because you're going to be smacking mm. a mountain as well. That's so right. <laughs> that's it right. works. Actually, that's, that's good. It's a good metaphor, the, the donut of aeroplanes. Yeah. Mm, So, if we we reorient ourselves to the economic destination that we do want, and this is an economy which is regenerative and distributive by design, and all of a sudden new questions about growth come to the fore. 